My name is Tom Wickman. I'm the Assistant Director for the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, and it's my pleasure to be able to introduce today's presenter. Robert Bowden is an amazing horticulturist who I think has probably forgotten more about uh, plants and horticulture than I'll ever know. He's the former director of horticulture for the Missouri Botanical Gardens. He was the executive director of the Atlanta Botanical Gardens and recently retired from Lou Botanical Gardens in Orlando, where he was the executive director for almost 30 years. He's authored many different books that I'm sure many of us have in our collections. Robert truly loves plants and is always trying new plants and new varieties, and he's always willing to share when possible. His role in Directing Botanical Gardens was the perfect fit for him as he's incredibly passionate about sharing his knowledge and educating the public about how to better succeed with plants in their own yards. It's this passion to educate that brings Robert to this webinar today. He's uh, going to discuss ways to bring plants more to the eye level with his talk on vertical gardening. So let me welcome and turn the mic over to an amazing horticulturist and my friend, Robert Bowden. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Tom. Uh, not not too much pressure there, but you're <laughs> right. I, I do have a passion for plants, and whenever I have an opportunity to uh, speak with uh, people that have a, a, a passion as well, it's it's a, a lot of fun, and uh, I really look forward to this webinar. We're going to uh, talk uh, today about um, um, how to uh, plant plants that... Um, I'm having a hard, I can't seem to uh, forward here to the next. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, talk about vertical elements. Um, you know, so many people are living in areas that are much smaller than our parents or even our grandparents. Um, here in Orlando, for instance, we have two planned uh, living communities called Celebration and Baldwin Park. And by the time you add swing sets and, and patios and barbecue grills and all of that, you, your backyard may be uh, 25 by 25. And for those of us who grew up on a lot of acres, it seems a little a little um, um, tough to handle. But um, so what we've learned to do over the years is to grow up and not out. So we grow, we grow vines, we grow um, uh, columnar or fastigate plants like you see here um, because there just isn't any room. But you can get some wonderful opportunities growing up, whether it be indoors or outdoors, and we're going to talk a little bit about all of those today. Well, vertical gardening, uh, it's an alternative method for gardening, uh, and it just in, it improves the scope of growing plants in a vertical space. There's lots of gardening systems out there uh, and I'm sure all of us have different ideas of what constitute a vertical garden, but would include things like something as simple as uh, hanging baskets. Um, you know, one thing that we've noticed, uh, I'm a, a, a reviewer for the American Bloom Program, and we go visit communities all over the country. Uh, people take such a pride in how their uh, city looks, and uh, things like hanging baskets are a great way uh, to make that happen. So as I mentioned, it's both indoors and outdoors. We have seen over the last 10 years a real upsurge in how people are growing plants indoors. And uh, there are things like living walls. And in this case, we have a combination of living walls where the plants are actually growing on the wall. But at the, And then there's also plants at the bottom. But you can see we've got an incredible number of different plants in a, in a, a square foot of um, plant living plants on walls. So uh, <clears throat> it has a lot of benefits, but of course it's just the idea that you've got green plants in an indoor space is pretty interesting. Um, <clears throat> and if you, if you don't have a small yard, you've got yards or gardens that pose a certain uh, barriers, and in this case, we have this horrible slope. Uh, try imagine trying to landscape a, a slope like that. But here they've taken uh, an opportunity to create, which is really a quite a nice trellis, I think, in a very limited space. Uh, this was a, a friend of mine uh, up in uh, Michigan, 
uh, who created this space and I uh, really didn't uh, have an idea of what they could plant on the slope but he really wanted this trellis uh, to uh, uh, he could he could grow a variety of different plants and he grows a lot of uh, uh, food producing vines uh, on on this trellis as well so it it uh, serves dual purpose <clears throat> As I said, something as simple, <clears throat> excuse me, as uh, hanging baskets, uh, you know, they look easy. They're not really that easy. I mean, just ask the people at the theme parks how difficult it is to grow hanging baskets when it's 98 degrees and 98% humidity for a better part of the year. Uh, thank goodness the uh, seed companies uh, are beginning to use these multi-pellet prills where you select a, a color combination and put a, put a single prill in the center of that hanging basket and water uh, the plant and poof, up it comes. You get this beautiful hanging basket. So even the uh, seed companies recognize that uh, you know growing vertical uh, is pretty important. And this is a good example of one of those combination prills. Uh, there's two or three different kinds of plants in there and all you have to do is water. It makes life so, so easy compared to what we used to have to do. <clears throat> As I said, living walls are very, very popular. Unfortunately, um, they're all, many of them are uh, very, very difficult. Um, I've been involved in, in living walls inside and outside um, for probably 20 years, and we've gone through a lot of trials and tribulations with uh, plants and selecting those plants that are appropriate for growing indoors. And uh, it's not easy growing uh, growing the, the plants indoors because of our climate control that we have. But once you, once you get a plant pallet down, uh, depending on where in the country you live and depending on your interior climate uh, controls, uh, it can be done. Imagine sitting in this bathtub with a good Grower Talks magazine uh, and have these beautiful plants right there. It's possible, but uh, it's going to, it probably gonna take you a little time to find out what plants are going to do well. So it's not, it's not success right at the very beginning. It's, a, it's a, a trial to see which plants are gonna do well. Now, of course, when you do it outside, like the wall you see on the left, um, it's a little easier because you can select a wide range of plants uh, with different colors and different textures and flowers, different scents, uh, depending on what kind of uh, landscape you're trying to create. I mean, here we have a, almost an instant tropical garden with the beautiful um, calocations. I believe that's teacup and other things that are growing on the wall. But you can see from the scale of the dog and the stepping stones, there's not a lot of space there. I think at the most, it may be three feet deep, but the wall is eight feet tall. So it's not so much uh, the, the number of plants and how it looks uh, on a square foot, it's more <clears throat> on a cubic foot. Um, I was asked um, last year to, uh, and for several years, to participate as a judge at the uh, um, Philadelphia Flower Show. And one thing that I've noticed at that show over the years is uh, a um, in, increase in the number of plant people that are growing plants, not only indoors, but in a, in a very unique, unusual way. And living wall art is uh, um, becoming very, very popular. Uh, hopefully many of you have done the same thing and had good luck with it. Uh, everybody likes succulents, and um, in this case, I think it's quite nice with the different colors and the textures. Um, it's actually beautiful, and it really is art, is it not? I mean, it's just absolutely gorgeous. Um, I have to admit, I've tried it without much success, but, you know, I'm not home a lot. I'm out on the road talking or, or working, and uh, I don't give it the, the care that it probably needs, but I've seen some beautiful ones out there. This is a friend of mine up in Seattle. Uh, and, um, you know, that's as uh, a friend of mine who grows uh, 
uh, 17 acres of phalaenopsis orchids. He held it up to me one day and said, you probably think of this as a plant and how well it's grown and the inner nodes are spaced just right and the flower is very well done and the foliage is beautiful. And, but, but you're, but you're, hor you're plant people. Uh, we, we sell this, you know, 17 acres of phalaenopsis orchids, not as a flower, like you would as a grower. We grow this as living decor, interior decor. And that's exactly what the people here have done. Uh, it, they're not plants as far as they're concerned. It's living decor. And, uh, you know, sometimes simple is better. And I think this is an absolutely glorious uh, interior. Um, you, the wonderful things you could do to entertain, and they would be incredible. Then there's outdoors. I mean, here we've taken what looks like a, what could be just an ordinary fence and added a lot of texture, a lot of form, a lot of color. Um, I can't tell. I can't remember where I took this from, but um, those are uh, just regular pine boards uh, that have been stained and then basically window boxes that have been hung up there and it has good drainage, as you can see in the bottom with the, with the uh, river rocks. So, it, it you know, for uh, a place that doesn't have a lot of space, I should tell you that on the other side of this picture uh, is only about 20 feet of garden space. So here they've, they've had to go up because they don't have space to grow other things. But I think it's done very well. Uh, and if I, I know uh, these people in celebration, they are constantly uh, changing these plants out. They change, uh, they get bored, like be really, really easy. And uh, they change these plants out about every two or three months and try something new. It isn't seasonal by holidays or anything. They just try new textures, new colors, new forms. And I think they've done a really nice job of growing up and not out. So again, this is this is a, another very small garden. Uh, you can see the plant that they actually took um, pots and, and planted them and then put them inside a little planter. Uh, which is quite nice. It keeps them off the ground, and I think it's quite handsome. But what you can't see is that from that planter uh, to the right, uh, there's about 20 feet of garden and a tall wall. So this is their garden, but they've taken what limited space they have and created a beautiful garden in the front and then a work area in the back to maintain all these beautiful plants and the plants along the wall. And you can see they've grown up. Um, so I think those uh, some of the plants that are on that trellis include uh, Ampelopsis or porcelain vine, which has beautiful grape-like leaves, uh, but it has these porcelain blue uh, berries on it. Make, it's very, very attractive. Uh, that's in Florida. It's very well behaved. In Florida, elsewhere, it's considered to be a noxious weed. But uh, no, it's not a Florida friendly plant, and I apologize for that. Uh, but it's a wonderful plant, and uh, it puts on lots of beautiful porcelain blueberries. But again, this is all the space uh, she had, and she made it work. Now, don't laugh. Do not laugh about this. But uh, I have a friend that lives in Baldwin Park, which is another planned community. And by the time she set up her swing set for her kids and a little patio for the barbecue grill, uh, she had about 15 feet uh, of patio and really couldn't, really didn't like the idea of uh, simply uh, putting pots with flowers out there. So she came up with this idea of, of concrete block gardens. Um, and the wonderful thing about this is that you can constantly change it, um, whether it be seasonally or if you just get bored with it, you can do it. The wonderful thing about uh, these concrete block gardens is that, number one, they're watered automatically on a timer. And any of the plants that are above other plants, the plants on the bottom get watered from the tops above. So 
all they do, all we have done is simply put, uh, we've cut a piece of landscape fabric and um, used some outdoor mastic and uh, pressed it against the bottom and then flipped it over, uh, filled it with dirt, and that's all the plants need. And uh, it's a, when I was working at Lou Gardens in the vegetable garden, we grew vegetables and this, we grew herbs and other things as well. And of all the things that I hope they would take pictures of and take ideas on that they could use in their gardens at home, which is the whole idea of a public garden, people took pictures of this. It's, <laughs> it was absolutely insane. Uh, this whole thing, each one of those blocks costs a buck. And so there's about 15 or $20 there, plus a little bit of uh, topsoil or, or, or uh, potting soil. And uh, it, it'll last forever. Um, and there's different configurations, of course, um, and the different types of blocks. So they can cantilever some of these things. I, th I think it's wonderful. I've seen some uh, in Seattle where I travel uh, quite a bit, and they actually stencil these concrete blocks, they paint them and they stencil them with all sorts of wonderful little designs. Uh, it's really quite, it's a lot of fun, number one. It's especially good for children because you can go ahead and glue these things together and they they actually climb on them. Uh, not that I would encourage that, but you're really only limited by your imagination. I mean, it almost defies gravity. Doesn't that look how old? Isn't that great? kind of love this thing. And if you go to... Uh, Excuse me. If you go to uh, Pinterest and some of the others, you're going to see uh, that they've made barbecue grills and, and uh, outdoor couches, chairs, and all sorts of things with concrete blocks. It's sort of a, a redneck garden, I guess, but it sure is a lot of fun. And plants love it. Plants absolutely love it. So let's talk for a minute about why gardens are so popular. Uh, number one, uh, it, it, it just, you know, they're just so limited space. Uh, these are, uh, this garden on the uh, left was a friend of mine, uh, John Murbach, who was in charge of Rockefeller Center Gardens, what we call the Channel Gardens in New York City. Uh, and he had a small patio like this. His apartment was so small that he had a stand on his bed to get into his closet. His patio was bigger than his apartment, but he made the best use out of it with a lot of bamboo and some other interesting things. Um, and gosh, this, you know, these are big patios. These are big terraces up, you know, 15, 20 stories high. Wouldn't it be great uh, if you had that much space? Unfortunately, um, um, we don't usually get that much space on in the inner city or even these new apartments that are being built. Uh, gosh, if we had this much space, think how much we could, all the different plants we could use. Unfortunately, um, this is probably what we have, a very little space. It's not very deep. And so in this case, we have some of these wonderful window boxes that are simply uh, placed on a, um, a south facing wall and a little window box. Uh, and that's, that's a big terrace. Unfortunately, most of the patios we get are only this wide. So you have to grow up. You simply can't grow out like our parents or grandparents used to do. There just isn't the space to do that. And more and more people uh, are going into apartments and townhomes because they can't afford housing, you know, a house like our parents used to have. So, you know, they're stuck with apartments like this. Um, and they, you know, they take the best of what they can and grow hanging baskets and window boxes. I think it's quite attractive. Uh, maybe room for one or two chairs, yeah, but you know what? That's their that's their little hideaway. Uh, one of the things I like about growing up, only because I'm 71 years old, is that there's going to be a lot less bending and kneeling down when you grow up. This is a, a wonderful little uh, lattice that they've created uh, hanging on the wall. And um, you can see they have vines there. They have individual pots. Uh, it's And a lot of it has to do with air circulation and ease of maintenance and uh, 
you, you could put twice as many plants on this wall, but I think that would ruin it. I think it's very simple, it's very colorful, different textures and forms there. I think it's very well done. This is, again, again this is sort of a red deck garden, but here we've got just pine boards that have been stained, and they took uh, mason jars and uh, put uh, herbs in there. You'll, if you look close enough, you'll see that those uh, uh, jars are held on to the wall with, <laughs> with, with hose clamps and with potting soil, and uh, this is their herb garden. And uh, not enough space to grow real herb gardens, so they grow it here. And I think it's incredible. Uh, this has only been planted for about a month, so uh, I'll have to go back someday and take pictures of what it looks like now. But what an ingenious way uh, to have a little herb garden uh, in the center of town. Uh, pretty cool. And, of course, hanging baskets. Uh, you can grow so many unique and attractive things in hanging baskets. Uh, like I said, look, people like Proven Winners and the others have made life so much easier by using those combination frills but um uh, and and don't just i would encourage you not to just leave it at that those frills are certainly convenient but there's no reason why you couldn't add additional plants like this uh, this was actually a prill combination but then uh, as they started to grow they inserted some reger begonias and some bacopa and some other things and some fuchsias even uh, to enhance that, so don't don't leave it just in their hands. Go ahead and add some fun things to it that are special to you. You know will grow well in your area. So this is sort of fun. Uh, it's a it's obviously uh, an extended care facility, and uh, uh, these this actually is uh, uh, for veterans and. Um, when I saw this, I, I immediately saw uh, um, how wonderful and green in the middle of all of this concrete and all of this pavement and all these automobiles and these tall buildings, how wonderful uh, you can create these. And all it is really, if you look carefully, uh, there are boxes uh, on a terrace uh, and they ran uh, some cables from from the box up to uh, the terrace up above and planted it with climbing plants and then also planted uh, uh, things like uh, impatience and marigolds and begonias and things. So, uh, you know, it was meant primarily as a sound control, uh, but obviously it, it turns into a wonderful green building and you know, do, having it outdoors, you're not so much worried about excess water. So it's a, just a wonderful way to grow up when you can't grow out. So by using the vertical space, you can grow more plants in a small area and maximize the yield per square foot. I don't know if you've noticed, but those are, <laughs> those are ammunition boxes for, um, I think they're probably for M50 um, guns. So it's kind of a, a play. Uh, here we have something as simple and as wonderful as herbs that we grow for food to share with our friends. And they're planted in ammunition boxes. But, you know, we shouldn't be thinking when we plant uh, up, not out. We should be thinking not of, uh, not of square feet like we do on the ground, but instead we should be we should be thinking more of the maximum yield per cubic foot. A great friend of mine, Barry McKinley, was a uh, landscape architect in charge of construction of the original uh, Universal Studios, and he promoted this thought, not talking about square footage and what it costs to maintain uh, a theme park by how many square feet. But we all know that plants grow up, you know, trees grow to be 20 to 30 feet tall, and that requires maintenance as well. So we went from how much does it cost to maintain a garden by square foot 
to an ingenious way of looking at it. How much does it cost uh, to maintain it? What's the maximum yield of, of herbs and vegetables per cubic foot? It's a very unique way of looking at it, but a more realistic way, I think, of, of when, you, when you talk to asset managers uh, about how much it costs to maintain a given space, I think we need to be thinking more, not square foot wise, but um, how much does it cost to maintain per cubic foot? And I think uh, most of the people, once they're explained, will understand that. So vertical gardening uh, can also reduce soil erosion. So many people build in the ground or plant in the ground and not worry about where that water goes, whether it goes in your neighbor's yard or into a stream or a pond. And when we grow up in boxes and hanging baskets and other things, I think we have much, much better control over that. And so uh, growing up uh, really plays an important role and being a little more Florida friendly. So in this case, um, the, there is a house uh, to the right of that gravel walk that you see. It's about um, two or three feet off of that gravel walk. So this is that uh, homeowner's garden. And quite honestly, uh, that person didn't have an alternative. If, if she wanted a garden. It had to be in pots, it had to be in boxes, it had to be in window boxes. Um, and you can see the neighbor on the other side has a lattice work going as well. This is very similar to one of the first images I showed you with a very limited uh, space with a, a wonderful narrow uh, trellis, but very imaginative. I mean, here we're seeing chives and other herbs and tomatoes, uh, there's hops right there. Not that you're going to be able to get any brew from that, but still fun to play with. But So this very limited garden, uh, and we, we couldn't do it any other way. And with this system, it's very easy to water and make sure uh, that the water goes where the plants need it. There's nothing that, that just cranks my engine more than anything is when people just uh, put up these automatic sprinkler systems and uh, water, number one, during the day, and number two, use impulse sprinklers, which, you know, on a hot day, you know, 30% uh, of that water evaporates before it even hits the ground. So in these, in these gardens that grow up, we're able to uh, very carefully control uh, the amount of water and we can spend, we can really really zero in on um, how much water certain plants require, and you can uh, change that um, season by season or plant by plant. So again, very very Florida friendly. Uh, watch and you know the water in, in my mind, water um, isn't a given; it's a gift, and I think we really need to be careful how we use it. And so when we grow up like this, whether it be in hanging baskets or window boxes or simple as containers on the ground, those all could be watered um, with um, watering systems that are very specific to that type of plant that you're growing. So good air circulation is really important. Uh, and this is probably more uh, meant for those people that are growing plants indoors. But if you water too much, then you're going to get fungal diseases. But, you know, indoors, uh, spreading the plants like this versus creating this, this total green, absolute green wall is much, much easier. Um, we'll, we'll see a uh, image in just a moment where it's a solid green wall. Uh, and they water that, but not all of the plants get the water that they need. Uh, in this case, um, they love the plants, obviously, and they've spread them apart. And each plant can be watered for for their particular need. Um, I think that's the best way. So air circulation, especially indoors, where um, 
you know, the AC is running in the wintertime or the summertime. And uh, you don't get, we usually don't turn the heat around too much in Florida, but uh, you've got to have that air circulation going, which is more important on those living walls than it is on something like this. So clearly we're not overcrowding here. Isn't that wonderful? So here they've taken um, cow fencing on a, a six by six grid, and they put another one on the backside and they simply uh, suspend uh, the individual pots uh, between the two uh, fences and uh, talk about good air circulation. Um, you can grow herbs, flowers, vegetables in these things. Uh, what, an, what an amazing way, innovative way. And again, if you only water those plants on the top, uh, if you set it up properly, put the right plants in the right pots, you can only water those at the top and they will water the plants below, just like we did in the concrete um, uh, block garden. So a very innovative way. I think it's very attractive. Um, I, I just love this. I, I wish the person that invented this as a friend of mine um, out in St. Louis. And um, needless to say, um, she's an engineer. So it was just, I mean, it just fit right in to what she wanted to do. But isn't that an incredible system? I just love it. So... There are disadvantages, and we'll talk about those. Number one, they require maintenance. Um, and let me say, probably far more maintenance than you can imagine, especially um, if you're new to that. Uh, if you plan on doing a living wall like this, my recommendation is you hire a professional company to do this for you. Um, there are, just off the top of my head, there are, and I, we did a talk with the Florida Nursery Grower Landscape Association about four or five years ago on living walls. And, you know, for all practical purposes, is there about, there's about eight different kinds of living wall systems, depending on whether you grow in plastic pots or you grow in uh, heavy felt, pockets um, and how you water whether it's a trough system or um, uh, just drip from the top down um, the the companies that do this have really worked it out um, the i think one of the biggest hurdles uh, of these living walls uh, is the type of plants that you use um, i have uh, a few friends in some of the theme parks and they have grown living walls both indoors and outdoors and they said you know the, the maintenance the actual taking care of it is the problem is not the problem but it's finding the plants that will perform best in this type of situation it is stressful no no question uh, and you have to determine how much light how little light you have how you fertilize how you water how you circulate that water, how you keep that water uh, safe for the plants to use. Uh, and, I don't, and I don't mean to discourage anyone from doing it, um, but you really need to dial it in. And the companies that do this have done that. Uh, but, I mean, can you imagine, we have a restaurant here in Orlando, it's at a golf club, and as you uh, go into their restaurant, uh, outside, you're waiting uh, to get a seat, and there's this incredible living wall. And the living wall is all herbs. And uh, when I talked to the people about that, talked to the company that maintains it, it was one of the hardest living walls they've ever had to do because it was um, a microclimate, and it was we could only use herbs. And they did, in fact, harvest those herbs and use them in the restaurant. But uh, they tried to do it themselves with very little success. And they hired a company, and now a company comes in uh, every two weeks and maintains it. So it's a little expensive for them, 
but um, he said for for the the show, you know, to show people one that were uh, interested in saving and helping the planet, and two to show people that we really do use fresh ingredients in our in our meals uh, far exceeded uh, the cost in their mind. So they really enjoyed the uh, the living walls, but it takes maintenance. It takes some maintenance until until you get it started. So, you know, they're not suitable for all kinds of plants. A friend of mine who works um, at Walt Disney World, uh, when we used to have the flower festivals there, had a living wall. And gosh, um, she said she tried over and over and over again, trying different plants. And from her experience, uh, the best plants that she could use, given all of the house plants that are available to us, here in Central Florida with the popka where it is, um, were ferns. Ferns actually grew the best. Vegetables um, are not easy to do. Obviously, you don't want to put root vegetables, you know, like turnips and beets in a raised in a, a wall garden. Um, the herbs do well um, once you figure out which ones perform the best. Um, not all the herbs, not all the plants, the house plants that you may be familiar with are going to be suitable for growing on a living wall. Oop, sorry. So unfortunately, this was um, a new startup company and uh, they um, talk someone into creating a living wall inside their brewery, thinking that it'd be kind of a fun thing. Um, people might enjoy that. But um, they use succulents. And I think they use the wrong succulents in the wrong places. Um, you know, the succulents at the top probably should have been at the bottom. And the succulents at the bottom probably should have been in the middle or the top. The problem is... Um, with living walls, um, you don't know that it's being successful or not successful until the plants start to die. Now, hopefully the plants start to live and you're happy with it, but that's not always the case. And this is one of those situations where um, spent a lot of money uh, and have it look pretty bad. So they uh, unfortunately tried it for over a year and a half um, and it didn't work. They tried a lot of different plants. They actually brought in companies, but the companies um, uh, wouldn't use the system that was already there. They wanted to use their system. So unfortunately, the brewery ended up just taking this out altogether, which is really unfortunate. But um, you got to be careful of the water. You can get and you can get too much water as well. So that's an issue. Um. Maintaining a wall like this is not cheap. Uh, we're looking at uh, a person on staff uh, looking at this uh, for probably four to six hours a week, making sure that everything is working, you know, checking for spider mites and other interior pests, uh, fertilization. Um, it should be uh, fertigated, but not always the case. So, it's it's expensive to start it up, and it is um, an added expense. I'm not going to say it's expensive, but it's an added expense to your payroll to maintain. So it's important, I guess, to look at your goals of the company uh, or your home and decide what's important to you. But uh, they're, they're not easy to maintain, and the, the material necessary to maintain them is not inexpensive. So I, I'm a big fan of espalier. Espalier was developed in the, in the 1500s in Europe where uh, the farmers were uh, encouraged to move from their farm into uh, spaces inside the walls so they could be protected from their enemies. And of course, once a farmer, always a farmer. And uh, they wanted to continue to grow food 
unfortunately, there wasn't any space inside the castle walls. So what they did was to develop this unique uh, printing concept where you can grow not only fruit and berries, but you can grow flowering trees and shrubs, but you can uh, prune them in a uh, unique and fun way. It actually is a, a an interesting art form. And unfortunately, when people see it, they think, oh my gosh, you know, you have to be, you know, an expert gardener to, to do this. The one thing that it does teach you that is very simple, teaches you patience. Um, you plant this and you remember, uh, you know, what form you're trying to create. And you visit it, you know, every three to four weeks. Uh, give it a haircut, do a little training. In Florida, things are growing 365. So um, it's important that you, once you start this process, you continue it. But it, you can do fruit trees and you can do flowering trees as well. In this case, um, I worked on a private estate up in Michigan for Mrs. Charles Stewart Mott for the Mott Apple Juice Company. And uh, this is what we call the Belgian fleet. Uh, it's quite common, actually, uh, throughout Europe. Um, some of these apple trees are, are 300 years old. In fact, they they grow so large and so big that in the First World War, uh, the modern tanks couldn't drive through them. They had to go to the very end, which could be three or four miles, five miles, uh, one way or the other, to get around them. So... Uh, it's a very unique form. If you don't, again, a lot of space. It's very flat. You usually do it against a wall. Uh, but in this case, it's free form. But uh, you can grow a lot of apples in a very little space uh, when you do it this way. Or any fruit. You could do this. Uh, we've done it at the garden with figs and uh, avocados. Um, and it works very well. So here we've taken... Uh, I'm not sure what this is. It could be, um, uh, well, I'm not sure. Anyway, um, we have it uh, developed uh, against a brick wall in um, in a, a palm, in a palmate sort of configuration. And uh, uh, I think it's quite handsome and it really uh, grows up and not out. Oops, sorry. Uh, so I said we can not only do fruit trees, but this is a, a variegated beech tree um, that we did um, as part of the Kemper Center for Home Gardening at the Missouri Botanical Garden. This is a variegated beech tree, uh, and it's sort of a, a informal uh, espalier, but, uh, you know, beech trees can get so big that five people can't put their arms around them. Here we've taken a beech tree and located against a wall, uh, and it seems quite happy. In this case, we've taken a, a, a pear uh, and put it against the wall. Uh, from this one one plant, we got um, 40 pears in one year, and that one pear is someone's just dying to eat that thing. Um, but we can use fruit trees, we can use flowering trees, doesn't make any difference. Uh, add some interest. Uh, this person doesn't have a garden, has that little green strip, but you want it a little bit more. So they put some flowers up on the up on the terrace, as you can see, and created these wonderful cordons uh, of uh, flowering tree against the house. So all you have to do is attach some cables to the house, which is very easy to do. And then you, a cordon pr like this, you could probably do uh, this is probably four or five years old. Very easy to do, not difficult at all, but really a lot of fun. So this is called a double U, and if you look carefully, you see two U shapes in there. Um, this one is a triple U. This is also a um, pear tree. Um, this one I know is probably 25 years old, and uh, from time to time, all you have to do is give it a haircut. And it's really, really easy. But it's very interesting. And I'll guarantee if you if you plant one, uh, people will want to come see it. Because it's uh, everyone's going to think you're so special. What a great gardener. It really doesn't take 
that much space. Isn't that wonderful? Very, very easy to do. This was in a, uh, a parking area at the Missouri Botanical Garden adjacent to the Kemper Center for Home Gardening. And this is a, a typical um, apple tree uh, on uh, dwarf mauling rootstock uh, adjacent to uh, a parking lot backstage. Um, and these are probably 20 years old. Uh, but again, once you once you create these uh, and they've been in place for a while, you can remove the cables. It's not necessary to have the cables. So if that's of interest to you, you can go ahead and do that. It's a wonderful opportunity to grow fruit and flowering trees without, um, without having a lot of space. And these are just some of them. You saw the horizontal cordon in several of the images. Um, the candelabra. Uh, it's the Belgian lattice that we saw earlier, and the fan is probably the easiest to do. But none of these are difficult. It's just you have to remember um, what pattern you're after and simply create that um, by visiting it every three or four weeks apart. So we've talked a lot about structures and gazebos and, and uh, flower boxes, but you know, I'm a plant guy. So let's talk about some vines that we can use on gazebos and and uh, uh, ter um, trellises and so on. We're gonna talk about some vines here. One of my all time favorite is the uh, bow tie vine. Um, a funny story. I was um, an instructor at the Disney Institute uh, and there was a one acre garden that was created by uh, the uh, Stephen Padigas, uh, who's a wonderful landscape architect here in Orlando. And uh, on the um, light pole uh, at the entrance to the garden, um, there was this um, um, a flowering jasmine. But there weren't any jasmine flowers. But every so often, uh, up this post, um, you could see these little purple flowers. It's probably uh, three to four inches wide. And I, I innocently enough said I didn't know um, they had these kind of flowers. Well, um, the jasmine doesn't bloom all the time. And this bow tie vine blooms spring, summer, and fall. So they planted the two together. So they had the evergreen of the one vine and the beautiful unusual flowers of the second vine so they they got me on that one i'd never seen it before but it's one of my all-time favorites now it's uh the flower is pretty fragile but it's certain to uh start up a conversation well we all know um pelican flower or some people call it uh, dutchman's pipe vine um there are uh, native varieties and um, you know the the the, um, the color of that attracts a wide variety of insects usually gnats and flies uh, to their eyes it looks like carrion so or, or dead meat so they're attracted to that and then there's a little scent gland uh, inside that and they crawl down in what they what, what happens then the little gnats will fly into the back part because it's more or less translucent. And while they're walking around and flying around in there, they pollinate the plant. And the flower only lasts a day. So the plant, um, the, the carry-on, that all that, it, it, it kind of sags and falls apart. And then the gnats and the, and the flies and stuff can fly away. Um, Tom, I hope I can tell you well, the only... Uh, vine joke that I know is the two vultures um, walk up to a ticket uh, desk at an airline and each one of those vultures has a dead raccoon in each hand and the person behind the, the desk says I I'm sorry sir but um, you can't take dead animals onto the plane and the one vulture said hey it's okay. 
their carry-on. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> that was pretty bad. That was, that's one of my new grandpa jokes. <laughs> um, this is kind of a fun vine. It's called snail vine or big caracal. Very, very easy to grow from seed. And I love this with children because um, it moves. So uh, if you can see, uh, a big bumblebee will land on that little platform in the front. And the, the nectar uh, that that bee is after is in the back. But when he lands on the little platform, it goes down. And above the platform, there's a little tube. And in that tube are all the sexual parts for the flower, all the stamens and stuff. And so as that bee uh, climbs on the, that platform and back to the nectar, um, those little parts brush the bee without him even knowing it, pollinating the plant. And then when he sips all the nectar, he simply flies away and that uh, platform comes back up again. And so it happens time and time again. It's really, it's really a unique uh, really unique vine and very, very easy to grow from seed. Um, I first saw this at the theme park here in Orlando, and I was just so taken with the colors of this. This is an annual. It's actually uh, in the Morning Glory family, and uh, I love the way the colors go from this really in in intense scarlet color to a polar white. Uh, all in a uh, a bloom that's probably six inches long. Very, very easy to grow from seed. We grow it in containers. We grow it on trellises, uh, small gazebos. Uh, it's just a wonderful, easy to grow uh, annual vine that just produces so much color. It's unbelievable. And of course, we all know passion flower, passion flower in, uh, in incarnata. This is a, uh, the sole primary food source for fridlary butterflies. And I know uh, this is native. And I know when people see this and it grows, I mean, it, it is a generous grower. Let me just put it that way. Uh, they get uh, gardeners, homeowners get all upset because this thing is just taking over their garden. I mean, it'll, it'll cover a trellis or other vines even. <clears throat> but not to worry because the fritillary caterpillars will move right in there and completely defoliate that vine in a matter of three or four days, and then the plant dies. So it's a pretty cool plant all the way around and a very beautiful flower as well. So this is Rangoon Creeper. And uh, this is one of those vines that um, when you plant it and where you plant it, you have to be very certain that this is where you want it to be because you will never, ever get rid of it again. It is one of the toughest vines I've ever grown. And the, the, the image on the top is a typical single version of that. It has a very nice, sweet fragrance to it. And the bottom uh, image is um, a picture of the double form. But uh, as you can see, it grows too easily. 100 feet. So if you have a fence uh, that you want to cover, uh, uh, you have uh, a gazebo that you don't want to ever see again, this would be a great vine for that. Uh, Bignonia is a native. This happens to be a cultivar of a Florida native. This is called tangerine. Um, this too is a very vigorous plant. We, we planted one, uh, actually two, on a uh, gazebo in the learning garden at Lou Gardens. And by the end of the year, you could barely see the gazebo. And it, it was a 15 by 15 and uh, 20 feet tall. So it's a very, very vigorous grower, but very prolific. Uh, the flowers, you, you remember that the, the native one is yellow on the backside and brown inside. This one is a beautiful tangerine color with a beautiful golden throat on the inside and very easy to grow. Hummingbirds love this thing. So <clears throat> if you have an area and you've tried to grow vines in the past or other plants, 
a, a good a, an area comes to mind. Let's say you have a south facing wall, whether it's stucco or brick, it's very, very hot. Almost nothing will grow. I would encourage you to grow this guy. Uh, I've grown this in a variety of locations that, uh, you know, I just sort of laughed as I planted it because I knew that it wouldn't make it, but I just wanted to try it. And uh, I was wrong. Uh, this is one tough, tough plant. It'll grow in any soil, full sun to part shade. The beautiful yellow flower is about the size of a quarter. And uh, we call it the butterfly pea only because the seeds look like butterflies. I'm a, I've been a judge at the Federated Garden Club um, annual meetings uh, for all their flower arrangements. And uh, the, the, the ladies always uh, spray these gold or silver or different colors and put them in their flower arrangements to look like butterflies. Uh, it's a really a fun plant, but one of the toughest, toughest plants uh, I've ever come across um, uh, here in uh, Central Florida. So I'm not sure where we are on time. Uh, I've also included here for everyone uh, my uh, email address. Uh, <clears throat> if they, if we don't answer your questions this morning, I can certainly do it later. Um, and I would encourage you to uh, write this down and ask any questions or if you need sources for any of the things that we talked about, I'll be glad to help you with that. So um, Claire, um, do we wanna um, answer any questions that people may have? Fantastic, Robert, thank you so much for, you know, that uh, that presentation, you covered a lot of, a lot of area in the last hour and um, it's it's amazing. Uh, I know it gets my mind going about uh, different things that could be planted. Obviously there's been a lot of questions that have come in. Um, so we'll start first with, do you know any resources for living walls? Um, you know, those systems, you you mentioned the various, that there's a number of systems. Where should somebody go if, they, if they're interested in uh, planting a living wall? Uh, if someone would, and I can forward you the names of the companies that I used in my presentation for the Florida Nursery Growers presentation. I think there's uh, six or seven sources of that. Um, and these are companies that have been vetted, so we know that they're not fly by night. So if someone would simply like to, or if someone there um, can take uh, their address, email addresses and then forward them to me, I can. I can go ahead and, um, or send it to my address. I don't care. But I'll be glad to send a list to you. Fantastic. Um, you were mentioning about the um, the prills that could be used to create hanging baskets and things. Do you know any companies that market those? Oh, yeah. Um, Prover Winners, um, um, Ball Seed Company does that. I think Burpee sells those combined prills as well. Uh, most of the big companies do it now because it's so popular. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Um, someone had a question about uh, the concrete gardens that you mentioned using the concrete blocks. Yeah. Um, and they wanted to know whether the concrete affects the pH of the soil at all, whether you've any ever run nope. into a problem. Nope. Not at all. Not at all. Uh, when we first created <clears throat> those concrete blocks, um, we didn't glue them together. We just stacked them up because um, they sort of balance themselves out. But being in a public space, um, children uh, being as they are and parents not watching their children as they don't do anymore, um, they started climbing on them and I was afraid that someone was gonna get hurt. So we used an outdoor mastic or a glue. Um, the one that we prefer is called Fuse It. And you can go to Home Depot or a home improvement store and get a a tube of this with a caulking gun and just run a bead uh, on top of the block and then just put the block on top of it. And when we tried to disassemble those um, to create another garden, the, the glue held so well that we actually had to break the blocks apart uh, to, uh, to take it apart. So um, yeah, we glue them and we put that landscape fabric on the bottom um, so it holds the soil in. And as I said, of all the things they could have taken pictures of, this is the one thing that everybody <laughs> just loved 
because it's so simple <laughs> and it you know and it's also inexpensive some of these things you know like those those very uh, small um, limited space um, trellises those aren't cheap you know those are not cheap so you know start small and work your way up but concrete those kind of, I know it's a redneck but it's kind of fun I enjoy it kids love it <laughs> very cool um indoor vertical gardens um yeah. you know irrigating what do we do about irrigating and and catching water um i suspect you're gonna say that the systems are the best that yeah. they, they account for that yeah yeah i have seen um some homemade things uh and i'm gonna be real honest with it they look homemade you know they've taken four inch pvc and cut it in half and use that as the trough in the bottom uh, and then simply have a big tub uh, and the water goes into that and it's just recirculated. Um, it looks homemade. Um, if you remember that image that showed the, the fellow working on it, uh, he has a stainless steel or an aluminum box and all the water from all the drainage goes into that box and then that water is recirculated to water again. Um, just as in any um, tower gardens that you would create for vegetables or herbs, uh, you have to monitor that water and make sure that you're not spreading pathogens and things like that. Um, I think if you're a company or uh, an institution of some sort, uh, hiring a company is the way to go because they've got it down. Right. And otherwise, it looks pretty hunky, you know. Yeah, you know, that leads right into this next <laughs> question that, um, you know, our disease is a problem because, you know, especially some of the images you showed, you know, plants are very densely uh, planted together. So yeah. how do you, you know, is, is that a problem or is it all about just choosing the right plants? Every location, every site is different. So... Um, you know, we showed that one image where it wasn't a solid living wall, but they were scattered along the wall. Um, that, of course, is the easiest because of good air circulation. And that's one of the biggest problems. People have a tendency, as, as we all know, those of us that have been in uh, public gardening for a long time, we know that more plants are killed from overwatering than underwatering. Uh, so water is an issue. So you have to decide what plants are going to do well given the amount of light that is available to them. And then once you decide those plants and what of those plants, uh, how much water do those specific plants? So you have to be able to group plants, not only by what kind of light they need, but how much water they need as well. And you would think that would be an easy task, but there's literally hundreds of plants that you can use in living walls, but I think one of the biggest problem is one, overwatering, and two, uh, not enough air circulation. Right. And uh, and you can see on that one image, even though it wasn't getting enough water, um, the pathogens went through that whole lower right hand corner and wiped it out in a matter of three or four weeks, and all of that had to be disassembled, and sterilized, or replanted. And believe it or not, they did that three or four times, and they just could not get it right, and uh, they took it all down. And that's where, you know, your advice to hire a professional, they've got the experience to kind of know yeah. which plant combinations work the best, and especially in those those individual settings. Yeah, I mean, it's a, I have to say, when they're successful, uh, and I've seen them in the uh, restaurants and breweries and corporate headquarters uh it's it's remarkable the positive effects that it has on the general work environment in an organization uh to me when i see that whether it's in a restaurant or a corporation that shows that they care they care about me as an employee they care about the planet that we live in or live on and um, uh, it, it has really positive effects. 
Uh, the important thing is, you know, getting a, a good company that knows what they're doing and putting it up. Yeah. Terrific. Are, have you ever seen flowers, uh, especially fragrant flowers, um, used in vertical systems? Sure. Outdoors. Um, it's harder indoors. Um, and if you have them indoors, you're going to have to change them out more regularly because most of the time there isn't enough adequate sunlight or grow lights, you know, to make that happen. Uh, you imagine a wall, a living wall could be something as simple as eight by eight. You can imagine how much light that needs to keep the regular green plants alive, let alone flowering plants. Outdoors is a whole different ballgame. The problem that we have in Florida, of course, and outdoors is how much sun can they take? So you're really looking for, you know, a north facing wall or at very least an east facing wall. Uh, so you get bright sun in the afternoon or in the morning, but shade in the afternoon. West walls and south walls are just about impossible because it's just so gosh darn hot. Uh, but it seems like east wall, uh, east zones are, are going to be uh, okay. And of course, the north wall is super easy to do. But flowers are really tough in a, in a wall that are inside. The, uh, you know, when I look at my social media um, account, you know, I, I see commercials all the time for growing lettuce and things in towers indoors. Um, have you had any experience with that or yeah. any suggestions? No, they work very well. They work extremely well. In fact, if you ever have an opportunity when you're in Orlando, I would encourage you to go to uh, the uh, Orange County Convention Center. It's the second largest convention center in America. It's 1.5 million square feet. And they have uh, living gardens there where they grow herbs and lettuce there in towers uh, in several different locations and they do in fact use that uh in their uh in their uh, uh recipes for for these conventions that come there um it's a it's an amazing thing to see um and there is a little bit of chemistry a little bit of science involved um but um really it's it's quite easy uh, to grow once you get that down. It's expensive to start up, all right? Because you have to buy the towers, and you have to buy the circulating pumps and all that. But once you've got that, you just simply start the seeds and some rock wool. Uh, I've done that in my little greenhouse here at home and uh, put them in the towers and, you know, it's just off and running. The important thing, I think, is to remember that you don't want to harvest the entire plant you only want to harvest those leaves from the bottom um <laughs> i was re <laughs> it reminds me uh, we uh, i teach cooking classes uh, at lou gardens and uh, i was cooking some collards and i needed a few more leaves so i got on the radio and i asked someone to bring me some collards and about 10 minutes later she came in and I mean, she had cut an entire collard plant and put it on the counter in front of me. I said, what did you do? I said, well, you said you wanted collards. I said, no, you harvest the bottom leaves of the collards because collard plants can last, you know, a year and a half or two. Um, so that was a hard lesson learned. So, you know, whether it's lettuce in the garden or whether it's lettuce on a tower, you always uh, harvest those lower leaves and you'd be surprised how many how many leaves and, and the quantity that you'll get but those towers they work very very well the real you know, since you mentioned that I, I do remember at the landscape show um seeing that as i, I was walking through the yeah the convention center so that uh yeah it, that was i was inspired a little bit by seeing that so that was awesome yeah i was um we were at the uh landscape show and uh, be the day before they actually brought in some college professors from around the country that were interested in hydroponics and they gave them a full, uh, you know, two hour tour of that. And, uh, it's, uh, it's surprisingly easy. Um, the problem is, uh, the cost initially is pretty high. 
Um, you showed some amazing espaliers. Yeah. Um, what do you do? How do you deal with the fact that the trunks are going to continue to expand? Um, and, you know, is is that a problem with whatever structure that they're planted on? Well, um, you know, plants are pretty smart. And their roots are going to go in the direction of, of least um, effort. So when you plant a peach tree or an avocado or whatever it is you plant there, um, yeah, they're going to hit that wall or whatever it is, the, the rocks that you have in the back. But, you know, um, they're not dumb. They're going to they're gonna go the other way because that's where the food and the water is. So when you when you take care of these guys, um, you know, these, these roots are only on one half of the plant, one half of the root system. So you just fertilize that. So most of the time you're fertilizing walkways or you're fertilizing grass as well as the tree because a peach tree for instance you know it'll it'll have a root system that'll go out 15 feet in diameter so um you're you may be fertilizing other things as well but i've never had in all the years probably 40 years i've been growing espalier i've never had one crack a wall or or cause any structural damage okay. um, the real secret the real secret is to leave them alone uh, you know, people, they plant it and then they want to fuss with it. They want to tinker with it. And um, you can tinker with the cables and all that to make sure they're tight and get them all started. But you just got to leave it alone. And then every once in a while you go in and trim it to give it some structure. So, you, you know, there's some, you can actually see where um, the uh, limbs are going to go. But, you know, you, you've got to leave it alone. Show patience. Go, go work somewhere else in the garden. Just leave those espaliers alone. But it's just so much personal uh, satisfaction. I'll be able to create these and all the different patterns. The problem I have, quite honestly, is remembering the pattern that I'm trying to create. Because I'll be growing 15 espaliers at a time, for instance, and I've got I've got them all planted and. Hmm, Am I trying to grow a palmate here? Am I trying to grow? I've forgotten. So I've actually created metal signs with pictures on them, put them both at the at Lou Gardens and at my house. Um, you know what I'm trying to create, so I can remind myself that's all we need to prune it. Any um, tropical or subtropical fruits that uh, might be suitable for sure. um, espalier? All of them. Set the banana probably, but we have uh, um, Barbados cherry, we've got avocados, we've got guava, uh, ciabatta cava. Ciabatta cava is a little tougher because it only grows about four or five inches a year, so that's going to be tough. But the fact that it produces fruit right on the wood, right on the stem itself, um, that's really cool. Because you can prune the daylights out of that thing, and all you see is fruit on the cable. So, yeah, any of the tropical trees, mangoes, avocados, they all grow. Uh, the smaller leaves are probably better, okay, um, because you try to create the delineation of all these different uh, lines that you're trying to grow on. So that's why, for instance, Barbados cherry. We've got a beautiful um, triple U Barbados cherry growing right now there. And um, there's an avocado there that's a little, it needs work. It's a little out of hand, but I think the person in charge now of that area probably didn't know how to do it. And um, they'll, they'll probably end up taking it down and planting something that's a little more reasonable. Yep. Great. Um, one last question I've got for you. Um, would okay. snail vine seed be good for kids to plant in schools? And do you know how long it might take to germinate? Be an excellent plant to um, to grow. Um, the flowers are not well. I'll say they're sparse, but they're. You know, I've got a plant that I planted last year, and it's right now. It's probably got twenty five blossoms on it. Um, 
and it will germinate in a matter of two weeks or so. So uh, we got it from uh, rareplants.com, I think is the name of it. But just type in um, snail seed or caracalla, uh, and uh, you'll be able to get seeds for it. It's pretty easy to do. It's really a lot of fun. Well, Robert, thank you so much for taking the time and you know sharing with us your experiences and the the great images you've collected all these years. And um, you know, I'm I'm all excited, and uh, you've given me some projects now to get get working on in my own landscape. Sorry about that. <laughs> Everybody, thank you so much for joining us for uh, the professional webinar today. Um, I, do want to rem I do want to remind you that on December 12th, Dr. Gail Hansen will be presenting Florida Friendly Landscaping Styles. That's at 10 o'clock Eastern time. And remember to make sure you fill out your survey uh, that popped up so that uh, we have information for scheduling for next year. Robert, thank you again. And uh, have a great thank day. You the, thank you for the invitation. Bye-bye now. Certainly. Take care now. Bye-bye.